Hey everybody, welcome back to Touchy Reactions. Sabaton fans, we've got another special one for you today. We're going to be checking out The Last Battle. This is a, I did an original reaction to this with my wife back in November of, uh, let's see, 21. And uh, one of my patrons, Alex, asked me to revisit this and do a deep dive on it. There's only one more piece of content I could find online that I had not reacted to yet, and that is going to be the Sabaton history. So tonight's video, we're going to watch two videos. We're going to watch my wife and I's original reaction to this song back in November, which I'll edit in with my new style of editing that we're doing here. And then we're also going to watch uh, the Sabaton history lesson to learn the complete story behind this amazing song. I could not find any lives. I looked for the direct live by itself. I looked up all the concerts I could find and looked through all the set lists and couldn't find any lives on this at all. So as far as I know, Sabaton may have never performed this live, but uh, we're gonna go ahead and enjoy these two videos tonight. And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into back in time into the go back machine. We're gonna go all the way back to November of 2021, where me and Cindy sat down for the first time to listen to the song, The Last Battle. Here we go. Let's do this. You ready? Yep. All right, here we go. The last battle. The last battle. Hey. Samurai back there. Yes. Okay, a couple things. I've been learning not to pause, but I had to pause because I was getting too far away from the verse that I wanted to mention. Earlier it mentioned Jenny's at the gates. Uh, one of you had taught me that Jenny means uh, artillery or uh, tanks. And uh, the end of the last verse there was talking about how in this last battle, the German army fought alongside the American army, I'm assuming, to overthrow the Nazis. So there's a difference between the Nazi army and the German army here in this case. And, uh, you know, good on them. I guess they were tired of this uh, evil regime uh, doing what they were doing, and they decided to put an end to it and join ranks with the Americans. Um, since it is D-Day, um, my grandfather uh, was one of the very first paratroopers, and him and his buddies enlisted into the Army, and he was supposed to be a tank driver. And all of his buddies that he went to war with died on D-Day when they invaded. And, oh, the, the D-Day invasion? Yes. Yeah, and that's, he, that's, that's not this. but That's the, not yeah. this, but... But I like this kind of. I'm stuck. Oh, yeah, thinking. Makes you remember that. And and my grandfather was a personal bodyguard to General McCarthy. So, because he was so tall, they chose him to be a paratrooper. They wanted all these tall guys, and so my grandma's talked about that. <laughs> no, my grandpa liked my husband. So. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho. All right. So ammo's running low. They're depleting their machine guns. Every bullet counts until surrender is announced. We're going to back up five seconds and go.
Right. That was really good. Can I just say one thing? That guitar solo in there, he, he shredded that boy. Yeah, he was sweet. shredding. Oh, my goodness. That was some good. I'm like. I had to fight my urge to pause during the guitar solo. <laughs> All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that little flashback back to November 2021. Uh, I've lost a little bit of weight since then, and I think I got a little more gray hairs, but uh, that was fun to look back on that time. Now we're going to go ahead and jump into this Sabaton history lesson. Before we do, though, I just want to thank everybody who's been supporting the channel, liking the videos, commenting down below, subscribing, joining the Patreon. We wouldn't be even watching this today if it wasn't for a patron asking me to go back and revisit this. So shout out again to Alex. Let's go ahead and jump into this Sabaton history lesson number 85, The Last Battle. Here we go. Wait, wait, wait. In World War II, Germans and Americans fighting together? Oh, yeah. During the beginning of the end for the Third Reich in World War II, the Allies planned the invasion of the German homeland. Rumors had long circulated about an impregnable Alpine fortress stretching all over the northwestern part of Austria, into which Hitler and his loyal followers would retreat if the war ever came to the Reich itself. The Allies were concerned about deep underground bunkers blasted into the high mountains which could stockpile guns and supplies. Such a fortress could prolong the war for several months. Most of their fears were, of course, unfounded. But deep within northern Tyrol, there actually stood such an old fortress. Schloss Itte had been a medieval castle. Its foundations can be traced back to the 13th century. Over the centuries, the castle had fallen into ruin until it was rebuilt in the 19th century. In 1943, it had been seized by the SS and incorporated into the Dachau concentration camp system. The old fairy tale like castle became a prison for high profile prisoners. Some of France's most influential politicians and generals, like Edouard Daladier, Maurice Gamelon, Michel Clemenceau, and Paul Reynaud, were even held there. By the end of April 1945, the noose was tightening around the Germans. The Red Army marched deep into Hungary from the east. German forces had surrendered in Italy to the south, and the Western Allies advanced towards Tyrol from the west. What was left of the shattered remnants of the German army flooded back into Austria and Tyrol grew full of the last diehard Wehrmacht and Waffen SS troops, whose mere presence would keep many other soldiers from surrendering. But there was also another group there that is often overlooked, the Austrian resistance. After the Anschluss in 1938, there had always been a number of native Austrians who stood against the Nazis. For many years, they could only offer passive and nonviolent opposition. But with the Allies just a few miles away, they could finally act. They provided valuable intelligence about the German defenses and directed the army spearheads through the Inn River Valley. But their most important goal was to protect the Austrian citizens from bloody reprisals by the SS. Already people were hanging white flags and Austrian flags out from their windows, and the SS did not hesitate to open fire on these defeatists. The mood inside Castle Itter was dark. The French VIPs, very important prisoners, feared that the SS guards would rather execute them than release them to the Allies. But then on May the 4th, after the last commander of Dachau shot himself in his quarters and the SS officer in charge took that as his cue to disappear, the castle was suddenly empty. Bueno and Clemenceau took a stroll out of the castle gates and into Itter village, but quickly turned around. The roads were still full of patrolling SS troops, setting up roadblocks and machine gun posts. Back in the castle, the French VIPs discussed their situation. It was clear that they were still trapped and that it probably wouldn't be long until the SS reminded itself of their existence. So they came up with a plan. First, they would sew together a French tricolor banner and hang it from the inner walls to alert Allied aircraft to their presence. Next, they would get in contact with a rather unlikely member of the Austrian underground resistance. SS Captain Kurt Siegfried Schrader could have played the stereotypical Nazi villain in a Tarantino movie. Highly decorated, he had served as a bodyguard in Hitler's headquarters. 
After being badly wounded in desperate fighting in France, he broke with the Fuhrer and defected to the resistance. Schrader hmm. promised to help, but he knew that his authority could only buy them some time. If any higher-ups in the SS decided to storm the keep and kill everyone inside, his rank could not prevent it. All agreed that only the quick arrival of the U.S. Army would save their lives. Wow, so they were fortunate enough to have uh, someone higher ranking in the uh, German SS willing to help them, but they, they're going to need the U.S.'s help. That's, uh, that's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, very uh, risky, too, because if the wrong people don't realize that he's on the good side of this particular uh, situation, then he might get killed by friendlies. Uh, so that's got You got to tread lightly there. Just around the corner. They sent out the Czech cook to establish contact, but halfway to the American lines, in the town of Virgo, he was nearly caught by a patrol, but being pulled into a nearby house saved his life. His savior was Major Joseph Gangle. Gangle was a career soldier in the Wehrmacht since 1935. From the war's beginning to Stalingrad, Normandy, and Bastogne, Gangle had seen everything, but he too had returned a disillusioned man, and like Schrader, chose to betray his oath to the Nazis. Wow. Now, we don't quite know how such decorated soldiers gained the trust of the resistance, but at the moment, it mattered little. Gangle and the Czech cook set out to find the Americans. I'm guessing the way that they earned the loyalty of the resistance was by giving them data or uh, information, actionable information that proved eventually to be true. And that's how they prove their loyalty kind of thing. That, that, that'd be the only thing I could think of. You give us some intel that we can use, and if it's good intel, then we'll trust you kind of thing, you know. Driving just a few miles cross country, they suddenly spotted several Sherman tanks in a small village. Slamming on the brakes, Gangle, still wearing his uniform, got out, hands in the air. He was led to the nearest U.S. officer, Captain John Carey Lee. After listening to their story, Lee radioed headquarters, and after a quick exchange, the 27-year-old former college football star from New York enthusiastically declared they were going on a rescue mission. <laughs> Lee's unit was part of the 12th Armored Division, which now, after Hitler's death, was not quite as enthusiastic as their captain to risk their lives fighting diehard Nazis in the final hours of the European War. Lee, however, was determined and set off with his ad hoc task force of seven Shermans. His own tank, the besotten Jenny, took the lead. At the next Jenny at the gates river, however, only four of his tanks were able to cross a wooden bridge before it gave way. His force reduced, the column rumbled on. Arriving in Virgo, they were warmly received by the Austrian resistance and joined by a group of German soldiers loyal to Gangl. Although the Waffen-SS had left Virgo, Lee left two of his tanks behind to support the resistance in case they came back. The two remaining Shermans, the Satin Jenny and Bosch Buster, moved on with the Germans in tow. Close to Itter village, they had to cross another bridge, which had already been wired with explosives. Lee ordered Bosch Buster to stay behind and guard their only route back. Without further incident, the Satin Jenny and around a dozen American and German soldiers wow. arrived at the castle gates. While the men went inside, Lee ordered the Satin Jenny to turn around to block the entrance in the castle. Perhaps one of the most unlikely scenes of the war took place. An American army captain, a Waffen SS officer, and a German army major made a plan to defend French hostages from loyal Nazis in a medieval Austrian castle. Wow. I know. Schrader reported seeing several Waffen SS trucks moving around carrying anti-tank guns. Lee Knowing that American reinforcements were on their way, ordered the French prisoners to seek shelter in the keep while the soldiers took guard at the castle walls. They were only lightly armed with rifles and submachine guns, but the firepower of Besant and Jenny would give them a chance. Lee went to bed, but it would be a short night. Hmm. At 4 a.m., he awoke to the sound of gunfire. A German MG-42 was firing at the gatehouse, and Jenny's 50 caliber was answering. 
Tracer rounds were flying through the dark as the men on the western wall suddenly spotted SS men carrying grappling hooks. The SS was clearly looking for a way in, but the fire from the defenders had spoiled their plans so far. Gangle, Schrader, and their castle krauts kept them at bay, firing from the upper floors while the Americans defended the gatehouse. Real quick side note, uh, as soon as you mention grappling hooks, my brain takes me back to... Uh... Ooh, about 10 years ago, Cindy and I really got into playing Battlefield 2. Uh, we joined a clan. We played every day for hours. It was ridiculous. Um, but there was an expansion pack came out for Battlefield 2 that included grappling hooks, and uh, you'd have to use them to sneak into windows and stuff. Super fun. Just curious, have any of you played uh, Battlefield 2? And uh, were you around 10 years ago playing? Maybe we'd cross some paths online somewhere real fun online uh, first person shooter uh i've kind of faded away from that phase of my life now so i kill all my time doing this so anyway back to it great story here we go trust between the germans and americans had been shaky at best but now none of them would survive if the ss got in Shortly after 8.30, things got real. They spotted a 20mm anti-aircraft cannon and an 88mm gun northwest of the castle with truckloads of Waffen SS soldiers arriving. The first 88 shells smashed into the castle and the whole structure shook. Then a staccato of 20mm shells began blasting small gaps into the walls. Things went from bad to worse. Besat and Jenny rocked violently backwards. Seeing fire spurting from the engine access grills, the crew jumped out of the burning Sherman tank just in time before a second anti-tank shell sealed its fate. Wow. With their chances of survival now... So long, Jenny. You served well. Seriously reduced, the French VIPs took up arms and joined the defenders at the gatehouse. The elderly Reynaud, France's prime minister early in the war, fired his MP40 through the open window and Gangle ran over to help. But he didn't get far. The man who had seen the European part of the war from the beginning to its final battle was killed by a sniper. With more 88 millimeter rounds smashing into the castle walls, however, there was no time to mourn him. Waffen SS soldiers were moving up the slopes, pressing home the attack. With the radio blown to pieces, Schrader directed Lee to the castle telephone. Reaching the resistance back in Virgo, Lee yelled into the telephone that they were in need of immediate assistance or they would soon be shelled to pieces. Then another round exploded against the castle and the line went dead. Mm. Germans, Frenchmen, and Americans fought for their lives, but ammunition was running low. With Gangle dead and several Wehrmacht soldiers wounded, they were close to being overrun. Lee began pulling the defenders off the walls and deeper into the keep as he saw a squad of Waffen SS close to the gatehouse. Just as they brought a Panzerfaust into position, a sudden rattle of heavy machine guns tore into them. The cavalry had arrived, and just in the nick of time, with the additional firepower of the American tanks, the battle took a decisive turn. The remaining SS troops quickly dispersed into the woods, and the castle was saved. Wow. All the French VIPs mm -hmm. had survived, thanks to one of the least likely alliances of this or any other war. Marcus Linke, who does a lot of the research for these episodes, and I cannot understand why there is not a major movie about this story. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Man, there has to be a film about this, right? But I guess if these guys couldn't find it, it doesn't exist. The Last Battle. So I understand. I just got chills up my arms just thinking about all this. Uh, you know, just humanity. Even though you know you've been fighting, uh, the Wehrmacht and the U.S. have been fighting against each other and against the uh, you know. But it, it was time for that all to end. It was time for good folks to get together and and just do the right thing. And and it's just awesome, you know. One thing that I've definitely turned a corner on since uh, starting this journey into this Sabaton rabbit hole is I've learned that not a vast majority of the uh, German army 
during World War One and Two were just German people that were following orders and trying to stay out of prison and trying to not be executed by their leadership. Uh, so they were just doing what they thought was right, and that they, they weren't bad people. They were just doing what they thought was right. Don't get me wrong. There were some evil bastards on their side, but uh, a, a good majority of the folks fighting for the German uh, homeland were just doing so to survive. They weren't doing it because they believed in the ideology. So they were probably welcoming, finally, you know, the war is going to be over soon. This uh, Nazi dictatorship is going to be overthrown and, and we can go back to life as usual. So this was a great opportunity for them to help make that happen. And shout out to all of them for making that choice. I understand why you would pick this, but I'm surprised how you, how did you discover this? I can't even remember actually, if I'm honest. Yeah? It's just how I think it was an email, a book or something. Yeah. I remember so clearly like reading about it, how I instantly knew that this is a song. Hell yeah. Uh, and it was such a, writing the lyrics for, for the first was amazing fun. Just only writing the music as well. Finally, it, you can do something that's a little bit more positive, happy, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I mean, I like catchy heavy metal. Uh, every does every song doesn't have to be super dark. Yeah. It's I like it when it's you know opens yeah, but up. You, a bit. But you guys are fairly bombastic, and it's nice that yeah. yeah. I, no, I'm with you. I'm with this you one is like yeah, the message and the music, uh, and also messing with the fans. We like doing that is in uh, lyrics. We do it every now and then in some of them. Uh, for example, in this case, there's Tank called Jenny <clears throat> uh, in the battle. Yeah. And of course, we were singing Jenny at the gates as yeah. the SS opened fire. And if, I mean, if you haven't read anything, yeah, you, you, you don't. Jenny at, what, what, what's this, you know? So who's she? Yeah, who's this Jenny girl? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Who is she? What does she mean to you, Joachim? Yes. Oh, Jenny's my longtime lover. <laughs> does, does, your, does your lady friend watch this? I hope not. <laughs> but you know, it, it's interesting just how just that action of the unlikeliest of people to be fighting with each other, because that same year, something we covered in the Time Ghost uh, series, the Indonesian War of Independence. Late in 1945, in Indonesia, you had the Japanese and British soldiers fighting together. It was the weirdest thing to read that. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Uh, yep, yeah, British and Japanese fighting against. And this, 1945 was one crazy ass year. Yep. And we're talking about it from uh, 75 years later in another crazy ass year. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this year's not done. We still have uh, an asteroid uh, heading to destroy Earth. <laughs> we have the wildfires. You're releasing your first solo album on October 16th, if I'm not mistaken. R&B album. Yeah, yeah, nineties. I had no idea that uh, Joachim was had a solo album. Was that just a joke? He said R and B. I know that was a joke, but uh, did, did he? No, he didn't do a solo album. Come on, R and B album. It's and it's called it's called and me. I'm Joachim. <laughs> you complete each other's sentences. Okay, anyhow, back to the last battle. Um, <clears throat> so now, how often do you do this one live? Never did it like yeah, that's what I was. I, I was that was my guess. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I can attest to that. I could not find a live version of this online. But it's funny because we've just been talking about the positivity of the uh, in terms of musicality and stuff. Yeah. Why have you never done it live? Uh, it never be became that popular. Actually, yeah. it's the same. It's so weird because you can always guess when you're making an album is this going to be a popular song or not. Uh, this one I thought would. Oh, so I mean, on every album. I predict like two or three, that's gonna be great. Yeah. And I usually have one wrong. Yeah. And the other way around. These two or three, I, uh, even though they're good songs, I don't think the, the audience or concert going fans. You don't think are, it would be? Uh, would but you never mind. tested it out. No, uh, but we also be, have statistics on how, many, oh, yeah. to, how much it's played on radio and streamed. And well, stuff. Was, who was it? The, 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 and we actually speak to our fans. So we know oh, yeah, that's true, actually. <laughs> yeah, they do. And they have this channel so the fans can speak to them as well. Yep. And that reminds me, bringing things around further, um, you guys were in the middle of touring Russia when, when Corona hit and you had to leave the tour. Yes. Now, as of today, is there, what is the status on any of your touring or shows for the rest of the year or the beginning of next year? All right, real quick. <clears throat> this was released in 2020. 
I'm recording my reaction to this in 2022. In 10 days, I'll be in Nashville, Tennessee, watching Sabaton live for the first time. I'm super excited about it. My wife's going to be with me. She's been listening to the music, trying to learn as much about the songs as she can so that she can have a good time enjoying it with me. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. We got 10 days before I get to see these guys perform live. I got great seats, and uh, I'm I'm crazy excited about it. So I'm, I'm happy to be revisiting some of this old uh, Sabaton content. Uh, we are on, on go until uh, proven wrong, if you know what I mean. Okay. Uh, we are, which I really like. Our earliest plans is to go back to Russia and finish what we started in November. Sure. Okay. And that's something I'm really happy about. And as it looks now, it's it should be doable. I mean, obviously we're going to follow local laws and regulations. You know, if we won't be allowed to do the tour, we're not going to be dicks and try and enforce, you know, heavy metal down people's throats. What about Sabaton Cruise? Sabaton Cruise, so far, so good. Uh, we are going to leave a notification on the 19th of October, I think. Okay. Uh, we'll have the final meeting with Celia, and then we'll see. Because the thing is here, the only thing we can do is prepare to make everything ready so we can do shows. Yeah. But, as you, you all realize here, lo local laws and regulations change on a daily basis. Yeah, sure. But yeah. the thing is, I, um, I, don't, I don't see it as a, a big problem. Uh, it, it's a shame if we have to cancel concerts, Yeah. but we are going to make sure everybody gets a refund or we're going to reschedule the concerts. And you know, because we've mentioned it before, and I'll say it again, that on the Sabaton Cruise, if it gets to go this year, that I will do bar piano. I will sit there and sing and play a bunch of Sabaton songs. Nice. On lounge piano. Nice. I'm looking forward to that. Too. I know it's going to be really fun. I think it's going to be great. That's uh, yeah. We should film that actually. I, I don't see how we're going to avoid filming it because everybody's <laughs> going to be standing there with their cameras. <laughs> so, I mean properly. So, with, uh, you hear that, Richard? Yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes with us touring so much. Yeah. Not at the moment though, but it, it's easy to get sort of a, a little bit tired of it. I mean, it's not like I. In the middle of a tour, I want to go and karaoke sing a Sabaton song. That's right, yeah, sure. Obviously. That'd be weird. weird. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Especially in between. I like to do and see different things. And, I mean, you playing Sabaton songs on a piano in a very different take. Yes. That is something I would really love to see. And I've, yes. Also, I mean, a lot of artists doing covers of us online. I really enjoy watching it. And I mean, I think it's the ultimate, uh, what we need to remember as artists that even if we, it's a young person who doesn't have any experience, can barely play their instrument, it is still the sort of the ultimate form of a compliment you can give, yeah, give absolutely. a musician. I like your music so much. So I'm not going to write my own, I'm going to perform yours. Instead. And I'm going to perform it in front of other people so I can go, yeah, yeah. yeah? So I, I, I love it actually. But. Let me know if you guys want me to uh, do any reactions to people doing covers of Sabaton songs. I've already seen Amaranth do uh, 80 Second All The Way, but if there's some other good covers of Sabaton music out there, let me know and I'll, I'll look them up. But uh, I will say this, uh, hopefully the Sabaton Cruise will go ahead and then I will do the piano show and you will get to see it right here on Sabaton History. Thank you very much, guys. Let's go. Let's go. All right, everyone. You know the drill. You click, 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 click. Get some subscriptions. Check out Indy's other channels. Become a Patreon. That's it. Get the fuck out of here. All right, as always, please support Sabaton History on Patreon. And if you can support me on Patreon, too, I'd appreciate, appreciate that. So... That is all we got for this deep dive. Shout out again to Alex for requesting this. Uh, he's a very generous patron, and uh, I'm happy I could come back and revisit this for him. I hope you guys enjoyed this reaction today. If you did, hit that like button down below. It doesn't hurt you at all. It makes me feel good when people like my videos. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, there's a big red button down below. Click on that. It'll turn gray, let you know you have subscribed. If you hit that bell off to the side, it'll let you know anytime I drop some new content over here at Touchy Reactions. As discussed, I have a Patreon. There's a link up in the corner. There's also a link down below if you'd like to join the Patreon. Come on over. If you join today, it'll automatically give you 30 days worth of content right away because I'm always 30 days ahead on Patreon. So thank you to all my patrons. And that is all I got for this reaction. So hey, I appreciate you stopping by. And don't forget to come on back.